How you doing? Happy Memorial Day weekend. I got to say one thing before I get funny because this is serious. You know, we see what we saw every Memorial Day. We, we do the pledges. We see a neat video that's inspiring. And I got to tell you, up until this year, it was just that, just a neat video for us. A lot of you know, in, in late January, uh, one of the young men that went to Stonebridge, that uh, his mom was a teacher with Dawn. Um, he swam on the swim team with Megan. He was killed in Fallujah uh, in late January. He was part of Special Forces with the Army. And we went to his service, and it was so powerful. And what I came to realize from that is that Memorial Day is not just a day. Because for me now, it took me 60 years, but for me now, Memorial Day has a face and has a name. And we are so blessed and so honored that people have been willing to lay down their life for this country. And that's just amazing. Amen? Now that I said that, let me say this. I know why you're here today. Because one of several things. Number one, you don't own a house on the Outer Banks. <laughs> or know somebody that does. You don't own an RV or proper camping equipment. Because if you did, you'd be there and not here. Which reminds me, let me say hi to all the folks that are camping at Chickatig. We have a new campus. We're calling it Thrive Camp Campus. And uh, there's a bunch of guys and ladies that are, that are camping in, did I say it right? Chickatig, right? So on the count of three, everybody say, hi, Pastor Pat. One, two, three. Hi, Pastor Pat. See, that gets you. And Dwayne's there, too. So... Half of my elder staff is gone. I just don't know what to say. Debbie and, and Karen are with them, but I hope they are having a good time. You know, I, I read this story where this lady was an investment counselor, and that's what she did for a living. She helped people understand how to go about investing in, in the stock market and those kinds of things. And she got good at what she did. So she decided to branch out and leave the company she was working for and hang her own shingle and have her own business. And as she did, it started to grow. And she was a lady of integrity and a lady of character. And people realized that, that she was honest. And so it just grew and it grew and it grew. And it got to the point where she realized she actually needed an in-house attorney to help her. So she put out an ad for a lawyer, and several people applied, and she went through the resumes, and she picked a couple of people. She decided she wanted to sit down with this young man. He was impressive. What he had on paper was really impressive. So she sat down with him, and she explained the intricacies of the job. And she said, well, let me ask you something, though. I need to know, uh, are you a person of character? Are you a person of, of integrity? Are you a person uh, that's honest? And he kind of looked at it, and he says, well, uh, yeah, I am. I am. Um, you know, I borrowed $150,000 from my dad to go through law school, and when I had my first case, I paid every penny of it back to him. And she went, wow, that's impressive. Your first case, and you got $150,000 for doing that case? He said, no, it was my dad. He sued me, and I had to pay him back. <laughs> that's not real character. You know, it's not. This week I was thinking about how do we talk about spiritual muscles? What are our spiritual muscles? And our spiritual muscles are our character. It is our character. It is how we conduct ourselves. Now, I'm going to help you guys out. First service struggle with this. There's going to be multiple times in this service. I'm going to say when nobody else is watching and your response to that is God is. Let's practice it one time, okay? When nobody else is watching... Can we be a little bit more enthusiastic? When nobody else is watching. Okay, now we're going to go through that, you know, and I, first service, it was like almost at the end of the service when they figured out, oh, I'm supposed to say that again. So you guys, you guys show up first service. Um, Reputation and Character, a book by, by a man named William Davis. He's a Bible scholar and he's a professor of, of Greek uh, care, uh, grammar, but he wrote this book, and he's just a bunch of sayings about reputation and, and character. And I want to read some of them to you because I think some of them are pretty cool. He says, the circumstances amid which you live determines your reputation. The truth you believe determines your character. Reputation is what you're supposed to be. Character is what you really are. Reputation is a photograph Character is the face. That's pretty cool. 
Reputation is what you have when you come to a new community. Character is what you have when you leave. Reputation is learned in an hour. Your character does not come to light for years. Okay? Here's a good one. Reputation is what men say about you on your tombstone. Character is what the angels of heaven say about you to God. That's, that's pretty true. So, so when I say the word character, by the way, this is not rhetorical. When I say the word character, what comes to your mind? It's not a rhetorical question. You're supposed to answer. God is? God is a character. Okay. Come on. What's character? What comes to your mind? Personality? Huh? Somebody funny? That's a character. Okay. What else? Truthful, thank you. Who you are. Scars and markings. Wow, a lot of stuff. You know, the fact of the matter is, character, just simply put, period, character is who you are. The problem is a lot of times we don't see who we are. We don't see the character that everybody else sees. I, I gave you in your outline a definition of character. I didn't even make you. You're not even going to have to fill in a blank here. I just gave you the whole definition. Character is the pattern of behavior or personality found in an individual or group moral constitution. So I think that's really a, a good definition of character. Most of the time, we all act differently depending on where we're at. Now, please tell me I'm not the only one, but I think I have three different personalities or characters, okay? Who I am when nobody's around. What I do, what I say, what I think, what I watch, what I eat, what I drink, when there's nobody around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, and then the who I am. When dawn's around. Because the who I am when dawn's around is different from the who I am when the, nobody's around, right? And then there's the who I am when I'm out in public. The who I am at Thrive Church. The who I am at the street, down on the streets in Mercy Drops. The who I am when I'm teaching over at St. Leo. They're all different. And I got to tell you, that means I'm jacked up. Am I the only one? Every one of us is that way, right? But you know what? If we're different in one situation than we are from another situation, we got character problems. So we're all screwed up. We got to fix it. That's why we're doing this series called Workout. That's why it's important for us to build our spiritual muscles. There are several things that are very true about our character. How a person deals with situations in their life speaks volumes about their character. It does. A crisis doesn't necessarily make our character, but it sure reveals it. Absolutely. Every time we have to deal with adversity in our lives, we reach a crossroads. And that crossroads is we've got to make a choice. We've got to make a choice between character and compromise. Character and and compromise and you know Jesus is our example Jesus is our role model if we look to him we see how he acted under pressure we see how he acted literally in almost every possible situation and scenario as we walk through the gospel and what we see is no matter where he was no matter what he was doing he was a man of character in the old testament we use different words in hebrew for character but it means proof, and it means integrity. In the New Testament, we use one word, and I'm so proud I can pronounce it. It's dorkami. Dorkami means foundation. Dorkami means integrity. Dorkami means proof. And I think that's so fitting when we talk about the whole idea of character, because you see, Character is all those things. First off, it proves who we really are. There's the proof part, okay? And, and there's no doubt in my mind, our character shows our integrity. 
or our lack of it. And character is the foundation that everything else is built on, or it should be at least. We're in a series, like I said, we're calling Workout. We started it last week, and uh, I challenge people. I know we, we, we physically, you know, I didn't go to the gym this week. But you know what I did do? I bought a slim fit shirt. <laughs> Carrie said I look slimmer today. Well, actually, I'm sucking it in really hard. But as important as working out physically is, it's just as important for us to work out spiritually. In fact, that's what God calls us to do. So over the course of this series, we've been looking at things. Last week, we started talking about spiritual maturity, what it is and what it ain't, and how we go about developing spiritually. In fact, the takeaway from last week was this. We'll never accomplish the purpose that God has called us to accomplish if we aren't spiritually mature. Because if we aren't, Satan's going to attack every crevice, every crack in us. And we'll never accomplish what God wanted us to accomplish. Today we're going to talk about spiritual muscles. And our spiritual muscles really are, is, whichever is proper, English teachers, our character. Okay? How many of you brought your Bibles with you? Let me see them. Show them up. Raise them, raise them up. Let me see them. We want to be a church that's known for God's Word. And the only way we can be a church that's known to be in God's Word is we've got to be in God's Word. It's pretty simple, right? And, and the only way we're going to know God's Word is to actually read God's Word. And that's what I want us to do. I want us to be a church that's known as that. Now, let me tell you something. How many of you realize that people are always watching you? I don't care who you are. You can be the most obscure in the background person there is. Somebody's watching you. Most of the time, most, I haven't gotten there yet, but y'all are getting good. Y'all are good. You'll know. You'll know when I'm there. Trust me. Um, praise God for second service. God is such a good God to give me, y'all. But all of us are losers because we're not camping or at the beach, so... What can I say? Um, oh, yeah, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, why do you think people are watching us? Well, I know for sure if we say we're believers, if we say we follow Jesus, if we say we have a relationship with the God that created us, they're waiting for us to screw up. The world is waiting for us to screw up because then they can jump up and down and say, see, you're like everybody else. And, you know, your response can be, yeah, I'm jacked up just like everybody else is because I'm a sinner. The only difference between me and you is I figured out God's grace is amazing. I want you to figure that out too. But people are watching us. They're waiting for us to screw up. They're wanting to see how we're going to react to things. And so with that in mind, what I want to do this morning is I want us to, to, to think about some things, I think, that are important facts about our character. And I've left room in your outline for that. So let's just jump right into that. The first thing I think is important is this. Character is more than talk. Character is more than talk. Do you agree you can see through people? You know, some people can talk a good game, but you sit back and you watch them, and they can't back that talk up. What's scary is the people that can back it up, okay? But most people can't. Most people can't do what they say they're going to do. And I think it's so important for us to realize that if a person is going to have integrity, if a person is going to have character, then what they say lines up with what they do. And you've heard the old expression, actions speak louder than words. You know, the bottom line is that your, your character is always going to be the way other people actually see you. Because we don't see ourselves that way. But your character is going to be what other people see. And if you go around saying certain stuff... You're going to prove where your character's at. I mean, if, if you're the kind of person and you say, Don, I'm going to bless you this afternoon. I'm going to come over and cut your grass. We know that's a lie. But if I say it, I'm going to come over and cut your grass, but I don't do it. Okay, you give me a benefit of doubt. Okay. And then next week I say, Don, I'm going to come over and, and, and help you work on your truck. And I don't go over and help him work on his truck. By the third or fourth time I tell him I'm going to do something, he's not going to believe it. He's not going to believe it. If I look at Ed and I say, Ed, I want, you to, I want you to come over. I want you to help me. And if he doesn't help me the first time, I'm upset. But we don't realize we do the same kinds of things. We say something, but we don't mean it. Our actions don't line up with our words. 
And even if we think nobody's watching. Whew, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Now, you know, not only is it that that shows our character. There's other ways we talk to get us in trouble, too. You ever known people that talk about situations, circumstances, drama that's going on that they ain't even a part of? And they get upset about it, and they get angry about it, and they get loud about it? That says a lot about your character, doesn't it? But what if you are that person that says, Don, I'm going to come over and cut your grass this afternoon, and I go over and cut his grass. And then I say, Don, I'm going to come over and help you work on your truck. And I go over and, and work on his truck, you know, or whatever it is I say I'm going to do, I do. That says a lot about your character also, right? Character is just so much more than talk. It's got to be backed up by actions. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11 from the Living Bible says, the character of even a child can be known by the way he acts, whether what he does is pure and right. In other words, talk doesn't cut it by itself. It doesn't. You can say anything, but remember, when nobody else is watching, okay, let's look at the second one. The second important thing that I want you to know is that character is a choice. Character is a choice. Understand, there's a lot of things that we have no control over, and for people who are control freaks, that just freaks them out even more. Because there are some people like me who want to be controlling every single... No, I'm not like that anymore. I don't think. I used to be like that, but John's taking all that worry off me, Pastor John, so I don't worry about stuff anymore. People ask me questions now, and I feel good saying, I don't know. <laughs> there was a time in my life where I don't know was not an acceptable answer, but I can say it with pride now. I don't know. But anyway, there's a lot of stuff we can't control, right? Right? I mean, let's think about it. You can't pick your parents, your biological parents, you know. You probably couldn't have had any control over where you lived growing up or how your parents raised you or what school you went to or what you had for supper because unlike today, my mom and dad would say things like this. If you don't eat it, you ain't getting nothing, you know. So there's a lot of things I didn't have control over, and we don't. But there are some things we do have control over. And one of them is, what is our character? You see, we actually have the control. We have the ability to create our character. It's totally up to us. It's totally up to us, which is the scary thing. Because the way people see us, we've made that decision. That's who we are. If we want to be people of integrity and good character, we can choose to do that too. And by the way, when we choose to do that, we are developing our spiritual muscles. We're working out the way that we should be working out. The fact is that we get to choose. And you know, a lot of times when we talk about choices, we get to choose sometimes the right way or the easy way to do something. And 99% of the time, the right way and the easy way are not the same. And most people choose the easy way. A man or woman of integrity with good character chooses the right way. And that's what God wants us to do. That's what he wants us to do. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. The New Living Translation says, When they cry for help, I will not answer. Wow. Though they anxiously search for me, they will not find me. Why? For they hated knowledge, get this, and they chose not to fear the Lord. See, there are things that we can choose, but I guarantee you some of the choices we make will jack us up for eternity. For eternity. Every circumstance, every situation, every drama, whatever we find ourselves in, there's going to be choices. And, and those choices, one way we choose is going to enhance our character. And the other way we choose is going to chip away at it. And if we choose poorly enough times, we ain't got no character. Okay? Just want you to hear that. Now listen, character is more than just talk. 
and character is more than, and it is a choice. And when nobody else is watching, okay, y'all are doing good. You see that? I got ready to turn the page. <laughs> now I got fingerprints all over my iPad. <laughs> Number three, character brings success with people. That's really a strange saying. Character brings success with people. And I struggled to word that the, the way I worded that, but I think you'll see as I get into this what I actually mean. It's easy for you and me to see somebody who has good character. It's easy for you and me to see somebody who is a man or a woman of integrity. And what happens when we see somebody that has good character, that is a man and a woman of integrity, what happens? We tend to gravitate towards them. We naturally want to be around people that we can trust. Because if a person is of good character and a person has integrity, the natural thing is we can trust them. Why? Because they're not going to lie to us. They're not going to do us wrong. They're not going to say one thing and do another. We can trust them. Let me tell you something a little bit about trust. Trust is one of the most fragile things in the world. Listen, you can gain somebody's trust, and it may take you weeks, months, or even years to gain their trust. And you can burn that trust in the drop of a hat. All you got to do is say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or not say something or not do something, and you can lose their trust. And sometimes for some people, if you lose their trust, you'll never regain it. You'll never regain it. But you and me, we look for people we know we can trust. And we move towards those people. That's why I say character brings success with people. Because people want to be around you if you're a man or woman of good character. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses, verse 3. This is, this is Paul talking. He says, we live in, in such a way that no one will ever stumble because of us. And no one will find fault with our ministry. Good character opens doors. Good character opens doors. Let me give you a great example of that. We work a lot with, with Mercy Drops. You guys know that. We're honored to have Joe here, the first dream. What is it? Chief dream officer. Well, what are you? Is that what it is? Chief dream officer of Mercy Drops is here with us this morning. But here's the thing. I've learned, and I've learned this from, from doing. Dawn and I are on the street every other Monday, and we're walking and giving out care packages, whether it's 100 degrees, pouring down rain, snow. It doesn't matter. And at first, nobody on the street trusted us because we, we hadn't proved ourselves to them. But now that we've been doing this for years, several years now, the folks that are homeless on the street, I'll give you a great example, they know Dawn. They know Dawn is a lady that will stop at the drop of a hat and pray till all hell freezes over for them. And men and women seek her out. Pray for me. Pray for me. Why do they do it? Because they've come to realize she is a person of integrity and good character. Why? Because we've been consistent. We've been dependable. We've proven ourselves trustworthy. That's what we all have to do. Because after all, when nobody else is watching... God is. Caught you off guard that time, didn't I? <laughs> I've told the story before, but you know, Dawn and I spent six years in the biker world ministering to hardcore bikers. And uh, we've had the privilege of actually leading hardcore bikers to Jesus. But one of the things we realized is I wanted to go in there like gangbusters. I wanted to go in there and tell them they're all going to hell and, and, and that they needed Jesus and they, you know, they were just screwed up. And you can't do that. Because you gain nothing that way. We went into the biker world and became consistent. 
When there was a poker run, we were there. When there was a, 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 a charity event, we were there. When there was just a throwdown at the, at the clubhouse, we were there. But here's what we had to prove to them. We had to prove we were believers. We had to prove we were Christians. Because you see, when you come into that world and you say you're a believer, you're put under the microscope. They want to know that you are. Okay? Now, now, how do they do that? They watch you. They watch everything you do, everything you say. If you go on a poker run, are you over there with that group of people telling the dirty jokes? Are you the one laughing at the dirty jokes? Are you at the bar throwing down and getting drunk after the poker run? Are you Googling at the women? They're going to watch that. And you know what? If they see you do it one time, you're done. You're done. You've lost all credibility whatsoever. In order to minister in that world, we had to be consistent and dependable and show the same character time in and time in and time in. And then when something goes wrong in their life, they seek you out. All because of your character. God wants us to exercise our spiritual muscles. And we can do that through our character. It's not just true in the biker world. And it's not just true in, 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 the, in the homeless community in Portsmouth. It's true where you are too. You see, once you say, I'm a believer, once you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I have a relationship with the God that created me at your workplace, you become different. And they're going to watch you. They're going to look at you. They're going to see if you're straight up or not. Are you credible? Are you, are you being honest? Are you a person of character? Or are you the one around the water cooler gossiping? Or are you the one trying to, I love using this expression in church, brown nose the boss? Are you? Are you willing to stab somebody in the back to get a promotion? And you call yourself a believer? See, they're going to be looking. They're going to be watching. They're looking for the crack in the armor. They're looking for that one place. Because it's all about our character. And you know what? It even happens in your home if you have unbelievers in your home. Who do you think you are? Even when nobody else is watching, God is. God is. Character counts. That's what Paul was saying in that verse to start with. We live in such a way that it doesn't damage our reputation, it doesn't damage our character, and it doesn't drive people away from God. It draws people to him. That's what we've got to do. Luke 2 52 says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. As we grow in character, as we grow in integrity, we grow in favor with those around us. That's what Jesus did. And the more we grow in character and integrity, the more we become like he is. Number four, people can't rise above the limitations of their character. You can't rise above the limitations of your character. If your character sucks, you're not going to get out of the gutter. Okay? That's true, right? And it's true in the world. I see it. We see it. Let's see. How do I say this? Um, it doesn't matter who you are. and It doesn't matter what you represent. Politicians. Let's talk about them for a minute. You may be okay running for local office dog catcher. Nobody's going to pull the dirt out on you. Okay? And you may even be okay when you run for a member of the school board. Or maybe even when you run for city council. But now you decide to go for mayor and people start talking about, well, you know, Joe did this and that and the other thing. And all of a sudden your character starts to come out. For some politicians, it's not until they get into the national offices that we start knowing what their character really is. In the corporate world, it's the same way. In the corporate world, I don't care who you are, your character will hold you back. You're only going to go as far as your character will let you go. Same way in the church world. Same way with pastors. Same way with church leaders. It is so important to understand that we will never be able to rise above the limitations of our character, which means if we want to go higher, what do we got to do? 
we got to be better at character. we got to deal with the character flaws that are in our lives. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, So get rid of your feelings of hatred. Don't just pretend to be good. Hmm. Be done with dishonesty and jealousy and talking about others behind their backs. you got to do what you're supposed to do regardless of who's watching. Even when you think no one is. Okay. In the Old Testament, there's plenty of examples of good, godly men and women who, were, who had great character. And in the New Testament, the same thing. What I wanted to do is go through and find one of each. So in the Old Testament, the man that I chose to talk about for just a few minutes is a guy named Joseph. And I don't know if any of you know Joseph. Joseph was, boy, his life was jacked up from Jump Street. Joseph was the guy whose brother sold him into slavery. You got to be bad when your brothers sell you into slavery. How many of you ever want to sell your brother or sister? Raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand and you had brothers and sisters, you're lying and liars. Go to hell. But what they meant for bad, God used for good. Because in the story, what we see is that Joseph gets to a place where he's in a position of high authority and prominence in a man's home. His name was Potiphar. And when you say he was in Potiphar's household, we're talking about the size of a small community. This man had cattle and, and, and land and servants and all kinds of stuff. And Joseph rose to the rank of being basically in charge of the house. Nobody had more authority in Potiphar's household than Potiphar. And Joseph was right beside him. Okay? Now, Joseph was placed in a position where he could have chosen the easy way and probably enjoyed it pretty much for a few minutes or choosing the right way which was harder and Joseph chose the right way Genesis 39 here's the story one day at about this time Potiphar's wife began to making eyes at Joseph Ladies, what does it look like to make eyes at somebody? Show me making eyes. Let me see what making eyes looks like. I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Well, he was making eyes at Joseph, all right? She was. And suggested that he come, oh, man, here we go, and sleep with her. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I got a feeling she wanted to do more than sleep. Maybe this is the PG version of it, right? Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in this entire household. He himself has no more authority here than I have. He has held back nothing from me except you yourself because you are his wife. How can I do such a wicked thing as this? It would be a great sin against God. But she kept on with her suggestions day after day, even though he refused to listen and kept out of her way as much as possible. Then one day, as he was in the house going about his work, as it happened, no one else was around at the time. That's the way it always is, right? I mean, things happen when there's nobody else around. But when nobody else is looking, God is. Okay. She came, and she grabbed him by the sleeve, demanding, sleep with me. He tore himself away, but as he did, his jacket slipped off, and she was left holding it, as he fled from the house. That's character, guys. Joseph could have chosen the easy way. I mean, it wasn't like he was hitting on her. She was hitting on him. And I got to tell you something. When a lady makes eyes at a guy, it makes them feel bulletproof and 10 foot tall. It does. And for him to resist that was hard. But it showed his character. It showed his character. He said it would be sinning against God. It would be sinning against this man who's placed all me and in, in all this responsibility and trust on me. It would be wrong. He chose the right thing. And it was a lot harder to do than the easy thing. Over in the New Testament, I look at the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul, amazing man of God. At one point, the Holy Spirit said, dude, you're going to get all screwed up when you go to this place. Next place you're going to, you might get, you know, thrown in jail. You might get beaten. You might get this. You might get this. And, 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 and Paul was like, bring it on. 
Bring it on. And we find that in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. Now, this is Paul speaking. But I now must obey the Holy Spirit and go to Jerusalem. I don't know what will happen to me there. I know only that in every city the Holy Spirit tells me that troubles and even jail wait for me. I don't care about my own life. The most important thing is that I complete my mission. I want to finish the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. Paul is saying, I'm going to go the hard way. I'm going to go the right way. When he could have turned around and gone the wrong way, the easy way. And the Holy Spirit already told him, this is not going to be, you know, a great fun time here. You may end up in jail. And by the way, jail in Paul's time was not like the Hampton Roads Regional Jail. Okay? It was bad. It was bad. You might get beaten. You know? He could even lose his life. He said he didn't care. What was more important to him was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a man of integrity. That's a man of character. And that's who Paul was. So we've talked a lot of stuff this morning. We've talked about what all this is. But I think the question has to come down to this. Are you a person of character or do you have flaws in your character? It's one or the other. It's one or the other. We either have the character that God wants us to have or we have flaws. You see, there's no gray area. That's the bad thing. And the hard part is to admit that we have flaws. Because guess what? We have flaws. There's nobody here who doesn't. Why? Because we're not perfect. But we can still be men and women of integrity and have good character. How do we go about doing that? Well, I want to spend the rest of our time that we've got left, which is only like two hours and 36 minutes, um, to talk about how we do this practically, okay? So here we go. Practical steps to develop your spiritual muscles. First thing is search for the cracks. That is cracks with an S, not crack. We're not searching for crack. We're searching for cracks. First service got that better than y'all did. Okay. When nobody else is looking. All right. Search for every aspect of your life. You know, the fact is we already have established I'm different when I'm alone. I'm different with Dawn, and I'm different with you. That's a problem. And if you're different when you're alone, different with your spouse, and different out in the public, that's a problem. Okay? You write that down. I'm different. I got to work on that. I got to figure out how to be the same person all the time. But that's one of those cracks because I act differently in one situation over the other. And then I need to start praying about those things. God, I know. I know it's hard. This ain't easy stuff, God. But I'm different. I'm different. I'm different by myself. I'm different with, with Dawn. I'm different with Megan and Travis. I'm different with everybody at Thrive. This is hard stuff, God. But you got to pray. Every time you see a flaw, every time you see where it doesn't line up, you take it to God in prayer. And you ask him to help through Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own, but Holy Spirit can do it for us. So that's the, that's the first step. Second step is look for patterns. You know, we are creatures of habit. Uh, here, let me, let me give you an example here. Let me tell you about my typical Sunday mornings, okay? I get up at 4.30 on Sunday morning. Yes, I do. God's not up yet. I wake him up before I leave the house. I get up at 4.30. I go in the, in the kitchen. I start the coffee. I feed the dog. I have the coffee. I go to the shower. I get out of the shower. I grab my iPad off the charger. I put it in my backpack. I grab my, my computer out of the office. I put it in my backpack. I take my backpack to the truck, at which time I grab my coffee mug and go back in the house and fill it up with coffee, at which time I leave the house. I back the Jeep out. I get out of the truck. I pull down the garage door because I'm too lazy to have or too cheap to have a garage door opener. And then I drive... 
across the, the West Norfolk Bridge to the Martin Luther King Extension to, six, to, to 264 to Alexander's Corner to 5555 Portsmouth Boulevard. I park the truck right out front. I get out. I put my coffee on the table there. I go back to the truck. I get my backpack. I bring it in. I turn the lights on. I take my backpack to the office. I go back to the truck, and then I park in North 40 out there. And 20 minutes later, I walk back into the building, and, and, and I open up my backpack, and I get my computer out, and I get my iPad out, and I go over my sermon. That's normal. Yesterday, because we've changed to this mic and this, John felt it was necessary that I rehearse. So I preached this sermon to John yesterday, which, by the way, took me 15 minutes. <laughs> and, and, and then I took my iPad back to my office and put it on charge. And I left my computer in my office, and I grabbed my backpack, and I put it in the back of my truck. And I never took it out at home. So this morning when I got up at 4.30, and I started the coffee, and I fed the dog, and I got, got my shower, I spent 10 minutes looking for my iPad, only to realize, oh, yeah, it's in my office. And then I spent another 10 minutes looking for my computer, thinking maybe it was somewhere else. To realize it was in my office. And that just jacked everything up. Everything got messed up from there. When I got here this morning, I walked in, went to the office, went to my computer, and started working on my sermon when I realized I hadn't moved my Jeep out to the North 40 yet, nor had I turned on any lights in the building except for my office. I was all jacked up. Why? Because we're people of habit. We have patterns we go through. Every one of us. And it's just as ridiculous an OCD as mine is. You know it is. You know it is, right? All of us have OCD. We really do to some extent. But I say that to say this. If we have these crazy patterns about those kinds of things, we have the same kind of patterns about our flaws. We tend to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. So what are the behaviors that we repeat? And if you can't see them, ask somebody you trust. We don't want to do that, though. We don't want to do that. Most of us rather have a root canal done. I don't want to hear what you got to say about me if it's negative. Do you? I mean, oh, I just love that. Yes, give me another, please, right? That's how we are, though. But we need to find somebody we trust that know will be straight up to us, that will be able to say things like, that's gossip. You know, that's none of your business. Uh, you're not following through. You're not being consistent. We need somebody that will be able to tell us that. I think it's amazing. We can see this crap in other people. I can look at every one of you and tell you what your flaws are. And, and if you tell me I got the same flaws, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong because I can give you an excuse why I act the way I act. Right? Or I'm going to blow off what you told me. You know what? That's what you do too. We come up with excuses. We blow it off. But we need to get down to the place where we realize these are real issues. This is affecting my witness and who I am for Jesus. We go to the third step, and that's we take some action. we got to do something about this, right? And so and that's sometimes the hardest thing. That's, that's the hardest thing to realize I got flaws, to realize I got cracks, to realize I got issues. And I've already asked God to help me see them. Now he's helped me see them. I don't want to face them. But now i got to get to the place where i got to say, God, help me. Help me get rid of this stuff. Repent of them. Now, when we say repent, that's a two-step process. You know, saying you're sorry is the first step in repentance. But repentance means turning around and walking the other way. That's where it gets really hard. It's so hard, but it's vital and so important. And a lot of times the easiest way to do that is to have an accountability partner. <sighs> that's hard, too. That's hard. For whatever reason, I have an accountability partner that I never asked for. 
I never had a conversation with him that I wanted him to be my accountability partner. I guess it just comes along. When I asked Pastor John to be my executive pastor, he assumed, he assumed right up front, just because I said, John, I need you to be my executive pastor, he assumed, he automatically is, there he is, my accountability partner. Hi, John. So here's the problem. John says this stuff. At first, it makes no sense, but once you realize what he's saying, it, you don't want to hear it. John says to me every now and then he'll call me or walk in the office and say, brother, we need to have a 5% conversation. And I'm like, why? 95% we're not going to care about? And he says, no, 95% is good. It's 5% that ain't good. We need to have a 5% conversation. And I can guarantee you without a doubt the next three or four words, the next two or three hours, suck. I used to, I used to have... Uh, a, a gentleman working for me at my other church, an elderly pastor named Pastor Jack Shaw. A lot of you know him. Love Pastor Jack to death. When he was working for me, he automatically assumed he had this authority. He would walk to my office. My door would be open. In one swift mood, he'd step into my office, grab the door handle, shut it as he's saying, you know I love you, right? <laughs> the next was Accountability. None of us like accountability. But I think we got to have it to be the men and women that God called us to be. We have to have it. And you know what? If I got to have it, I want somebody to straight up and honest with me. Because I found, this is what I found, and I'm not talking about anybody here. Trust me. I have found being placed in this position of leadership that a lot of people will tell me what I want to hear. I need people to tell me what I should hear. And that's different. That's different. And we get to the place where we realize that we're exercising our spiritual muscles. So I've been talking a long time to Christians. I've been talking this morning to people who are followers of Jesus. I've been talking to people who will admit they, they prayed a sinner's prayer and asked Jesus to come into their life. I haven't been talking to non-believers. But I would be naive to believe that every single person in this room has a relationship with Jesus Christ. So let me talk to you for a second. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let me, let me just talk to you. You can exercise your spiritual muscles also by asking Jesus to come into your life. That's the first step in the process. The cool thing is that the God of heaven and earth loves you more than you could ever imagine. He loves you more than you love yourself, and that says a lot. He loves you more than everybody on this planet loves you. And how can I stand here and say that with confidence? Because the Bible told me so. See, he loved you enough that before the beginning of time, he knew man would fall in the garden. And he knew that sin would enter the world. And he knew that sin would separate he, a holy God, from us sinful people. And he created a bridge. That bridge is Jesus Christ. He filled the gap between us and him. Jesus, fully God, fully man, came to this planet for the express purpose of taking on your sin and my sin and dying on the cross. But let me stop right there. If that's all he did, he'd have been a good man. But three days later, he rose from the dead, which bought him, or not bought him, which gave him a status no one else will ever have, Savior of the world. God loves you that much. He loves you that much. So you know what? The only thing you got to do is establish a relationship with him. It's easier than shop on, shopping on Amazon. It is. Because all you got to do is ask him to come into your life. I'm going to pray a short little prayer. It's called the sinner's prayer. If you basically say what I say and mean it from your heart, you'll have jumped the step between non-believer and believer, between non-Christian and Christian, between non-follower and follower of Jesus. And I would encourage you.
We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the next hour. But the God of heaven and earth desperately wants a relationship with you. Let's pray. Pray like this. God, I need you. I recognize that there's a void in my life without you. I realize, I realize that I'm a sinner. I've done a lot of bad things that I'm ashamed to tell you about, but what Pastor Steve said is, you already know, you were watching. I confess that to you right now. With all the, the, the faith that I can muster right now, I'm going to say, I believe you died for me. And I'm asking you to come into my life right now and establish a relationship with me. Quite honestly, I'm not sure what the next step is, but I know this is the first step. And with faith, I'm taking it right now. I believe you. I want a relationship with you. And I'm trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen.